Well, kia ora koutou. Once again, very warm welcome to St. George's Online Church Community. Throughout January, we're going to run a series called Pandemic Epiphanies. Um, basically, we're going to have conversations with the congregation. Uh, various members of our congregation have very kindly and very bravely agreed to be part of this brand new adventure for St. George's. And we'll be asking them, given the journey we've all been on, and at times a very challenging journey of all things pandemic, I'm sure most of us have been forced to sort of look a little bit deeply into ourselves, our faith, and ask some deeper questions and how we're responding to, to, to this journey. So what are some of our realizations? But it um, gives me very great pleasure to say that today I introduce the, the esteemed Gray Patterson. Welcome, Gray. <laughs> Welcome, Josh, and Happy New Year to you and uh, all my Christian brothers and sisters. Thank you very much, Gray. It's really good to have you with us. Looking forward to our, our conversation. Um, for those who might be joining, Gray, I'm just going to give a brief context of, you know, sort of the inspiration for this, really, the thought process. I mean, number one, biblically, theologically, the church calendar, um, we are in the season of Epiphany. It always follows Christmas. The reason being um, is that in Christmas, all the key players, as it were, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, shepherds, have greater realizations, deeper understanding of how they are now caught up. Their ordinary everyday lives are caught up in God's redeeming purposes for, for all creation. And it, it really does mean that our, our faith journey, our Christian story is completely grounded into um, the fact that it's our Christmas story is eternal, but it's also every day. That's where our hope lies. It's cosmic, but it's also commonplace, as I like to say. So that's the basis of this. And as I said, we thought if we ask some people, have some good conversations about that. And how does your journey speak? How does their journey? How does it speak into your journey? And we'll end these conversations with a bit of a, a question, a reflection, a piece of music. So that's that's why we're doing what we're doing. So, Gray, um, why don't we begin for those who don't know you? Tell us a little bit about your your life faith journey up until now. Well, I guess um, probably most importantly, I'm, I'm married to Miriam. We have uh, four kids, all, all living in Auckland, and 10 grandkids. So that's a, a really big part of our life. Um, I've been a Christian since I was 24. Um, and in terms of what I do, uh, in 2018, I decided to semi-retire from my 40-year career as a CEO. Um, and I'd have to say, since then, it's been big on the semi and quite light on the retire, and it tends to be getting uh, more that way. So as it stands at the moment, I'm currently uh, chairperson of three commercial boards, and I'm advising into uh, a number of businesses. And in my spare time, I, um, I play music with a, an aging rock and roller from the UK, <laughs> uh, which is something that I get tremendous pleasure from. Brilliant. Thanks, Gray. Um, thanks for the aging bit. Oh, I um, Yeah, although it is true. My, my wife said to me the other day, cut your hair, you, you look like an aging rocker. I said, I am an aging rocker. <laughs> I mean, Greg, before we kind of go into that, I know a little bit about your journey, of course. I mean, you, we, we want to ask how our faith plays a part, obviously. You know, what difference does our faith make to how we approach all things in life differently? Um uh, your journey, you you had a bit of a, a change quite late in that life, didn't you? You came back from a bit of a tough space. I mean, you, you have relayed this before, so we won't spend too long on it. But just your faith, how has it spoken into, you know, just the last couple of years, really, um, and how you approach that job so differently to how you would have done perhaps in your younger years? Well, I think um, there's two things that I've become very aware of. I, I think and it's common with a lot of my Christian friends, when I look back on the fact that I've been a Christian for 40 something years, uh, I still seem to stumble and fall into the same potholes that uh, I fell into 20 or 30 years ago. And I find that a little bit frustrating. But in the same breath, I've become equally aware that God loves me with a passion that I can't comprehend. I've become really sure of that. So at once, I've, I've realized that in many ways, I'm not sure I'm any better, inverted commas, than I was all those years ago. But what I've, what I've realized 
in, in sequence is that in spite of all that, God has this love for me that's unquenchable. And I think those are the, the two cornerstone learnings of my faith in more yeah. recent years. And um, I've been very fortunate in my, in my early 60s. Uh, God raised me up again in business in, in a decade when most uh, probably aren't likely to, uh, to do that. And I, I've had a very, very um, positive and uplifting 10 years. And, and now that I'm moving into another decade, uh, he, he seems to be reinventing me again. So that, that's um, a, a nice part of my story, I think. Yeah, isn't it great? The number of age is no barrier to, to discovery, you know, and, and growth. It really isn't. Um, so in terms of this whole, you know, epiphany stuff, um, and these can be, they don't have to be complete light bulb moments. They can be small unfolding realizations as the journey's carried on. Is there any sort of big is that you'd say that that what have you learned about yourself um we all in adversity we know that we tend to sort of realize aspects about ourselves the good the not so good um we, we all get greater realizations in adversity it's it what it's what tough times do what are some of the big sort of realizations for you or the uh, yeah big or small well, I think the big one for me, um, and I learned fairly late in my life, is that leadership is a privilege. Leadership is, uh, in the Christian sense, is something that God uh, will hold us, me, accountable for. That's quite different to the way that I saw leadership and prestige and things, you know, not that many years ago. So I think in, in everything I'm doing in business these days, I, I have a real sense of God saying, these are my people for whom I will hold you accountable. And I think uh, for me, getting into that space and understanding that concept has been transformational in not only the way that I behave as a leader, but it's been transformational in some of the outputs in the businesses that I'm involved with. So that's been the fundamental change and emphasis for me over the years. And most of, our, most of that I learned through difficult times, which is the way God tends to work, um, which brings me to where we're at today, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be asking everybody this. We know that um, this is unprecedented in my lifetime because it's not just what's happening nationally. It's the fact that I've never experienced something that's been so global all at once. Um, and all of us have tried to come up with ways to, to cope with the situation, to understand the situation, to make sense of things. And it's ongoing. And I know enough about trauma to know that when we're continually uh, exposed to, to stress or anxiety for a period of time, that's when it can start to kick in and bring about some changes physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, psychologically in every way. Um, I mean, would it, have you had moments of, of, of darkness in this where you felt that your, your mental health, emotional, spiritual health has, uh, has suffered a little bit? And, and if so, what tools have you managed to bring into place to, to, to cope with that, to, um, to help you through those places? Well, if I answer that question in reverse, if I can tell you what God's given to me ahead of that situation, we, we moved into a new house two years ago. And if I walk 500 meters through a, a protected bushland, I find myself at a beach. Um, and it's a beach that's out to a sand spit just off Glendowie. And most of the time, it's completely empty. And somebody has put um, a, a beautiful chair there, Josh. And it's got their name on it. But I, I refer to it as Gray's Prayer Chair. Um, I go down there three or four days a week. Um, I've got a list of people I pray for. I've actually taken some of them there so they know it exists. <laughs> And, you know, I've got to be honest with you. I go down there some days feeling wonderful. I go down there some days feeling distressed. But it's my consistent place that I go to most of the time on my own just to talk to God and have my own space with him down there. And um, it's become a really, really integral part of the way I'm um, sort of building my Christian life. So God gave me that, if you like right at the beginning of 2020, before lockdown uh, happened. So I've been down there. In terms of um, lockdown in 2020 was an easy experience for me. Not so this year, um, for a number of reasons. I, I, got, I got sick in, in August, um, but I've been troubled this year. I've been troubled by what I see as a growing divisive society. I've been troubled this year by 
what I see is the gap that's growing rapidly between the rich and the poor. So um, as I approach my wonderful space down there by the beach, there's some things that I'm almost euphoric about that, that have happened in my life and that I've seen this last year or so. And there's also some things that, that are causing me some concern, you know. So I suppose that in, its, in itself is a, encapsulates the Christian life in terms of its ups and its downs. So if I'm really honest, I would say that I haven't coped as well this year or in 2021 with lockdown, but I'm encouraged that most of my friends tell me the same thing. And I guess that leads into the, the epiphany thing to some extent. Yeah, in terms of thinking very much just as you replying, I mean, you and I were both there on that rehearsal for the, uh, you know, the, the Christmas Eve orchestra choir thing. And we both saw one particular person from the orchestra come in and, 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 and break into tears. And I think it, I think many of us were feeling that and I had to hold back the tears myself as this person broke into tears and just that whole thing of missing being in church community, being around a worshipping community. Uh, I, I would certainly say that, you know, I'm not just saying this because I'm a, you know, I'm a vicar of a church, but um, there's that Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone um, from Big Yellow Taxi, I think the song is. Um, and I've certainly felt that more keenly, um, the realisation, the beauty of worship, that we come together and we praise God. And that's where we place our, our right praises first. We're acknowledging that above all else, we're here um, with reverence to worship God. And from that, everything else flows. I mean, how, have, how has not being at church uh, affected you? Well, I've got to say, I've loved, absolutely loved the, the online services in uh, 2021, especially the series around the music. Because I think for people, it was uplifting at a time when people probably weren't feeling up, uplifted. But I know that um, I've been really fortunate to have been in church a bit over the last uh, few weeks of December. Um, firstly, just putting down some tape songs and, and meeting with three or four other people. But to be in church with all, all of Ken Leach's team, you know, two nights in a row, for me was just um, a, a, joyous, a joyous experience and it was uplifting to me on an ongoing basis. It was like the clouds parted for me. It was just so good. One, to see people I hadn't seen for a while and two, to be in church worshipping, even when we were practising in church worshipping. That's a privilege that most other people in our church haven't had. So I came away from that Christmas week just feeling wonderfully uplifted and, and, um, and, and how good it had been to see people and to, to be playing God's worship again in church was just wonderful right on Christmas. It was a, an absolute treat. Yeah, yeah. I think I was keenly aware, of course, that not everybody could do that in our congregation and some would have been desperate to come back, but because of the current restrictions, it's, it's not something we could entertain. So I guess the hope was just be that people were really touched by the Christmas Eve services and the Christmas Day services with our children. And, and the feedback we've had has been, you know, very, very positive. So that would be the hope, but I guess, yeah, just can't wait to the day when we can all just come back into church and be together really um, in, in worship. Uh, Gray, I mean, I guess another question we're asking people is, there's no certainty about 2022. I think we've all got to that now. We, we harbored after the first lockdown, we've all had this feeling of, well, when we get back to normal, and for us in New Zealand, of course, we kind of did, really. Um, we, 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 you and I, of course, were down on the South Island Spirituality of Music, which seems like a, another lifetime and another, another, yeah, a completely different reality. That, did that really happen um, back in, what, J July? Um, but I think we've all, it's been quite sobering to realise that 2022 will probably still bring about some changes. We have to hold things lightly. We have to surrender it to God. There's no certainty. Do you feel that this journey, how has it, or has it helped equip you for whatever uncertainties may lie ahead? Um, how are you going to approach this differently? And how are you going to exist in the present? Well, um, we were we were very fortunate twice in 2021. First in February, the day after lockdown was lifted, uh, we went to um, Mount Cook to um, 
uh, Omaru on a five day cycle trip with some, some of Miriam's family and friends in the most beautiful country I've seen uh, in the most beautiful weather and without a tourist bus in sight. Um, we got to do that again with the spirituality music tour uh, and took the long route home through Franz Joseph and Hikatika and Nelson. Again, we've seen some of God's most beautiful country with no one around. And that's something that I felt really grateful about. I, I felt really grateful way back then. Um, in the first week of lockdown, I got sick. Um, and I ended up in level four in a public hospital for some surgery. And three weeks later, back there again for in, in a private hospital for um, a longer term solution to that. And I was sitting in the hospital feeling absolutely euphoric. And I was saying to God how grateful I was for my health, for the things we'd seen this year, how blessed and how thankful. And you know, as I might have told you before, when I talk to God like that, sometimes I have this picture of him looking at me with his arms folded and, and he's saying, look, Gray, that's great that you're grateful. It's great that you're blessed. It's great that you're thankful. But why don't you tell me what that means? What, what, you're a business guy. Tell me what that means in deliverables. And what change, what difference is that going to make to your life? And over the next couple of days, I thought about that. And I'd taken up some advisory work into businesses that were struggling post-lockdown earlier in 21. And it seemed that working with these people, we'd been able to make a difference. It's a relatively low-paid, nominal role with um, some work done free, but it, it seemed to have made a difference. So I said to God, well... In terms of my gratitude and my blessing and my thankfulness, I'm happy to allocate even more of my retirement time to that project if that's what you'd like me to do. And if you can provide me with um, people that I can take up that work with. And, and to give you the short version of the long story, on January 20th, um, I, I will go to seven businesses that I will be personally working with, advising how to come right post-COVID, how to grow their businesses back to prosperity again. Um, and I'm really excited about that. And I feel really comfortable in the God space about that. And, you know, Josh, when I talk to them at their introductory meeting and I say to them, you don't know me from a bar of soap, what three things would you really like to achieve out of this eight-month exercise? They all reel off some wonderful business objectives, cash flow issues, budgets, strategy, building teams, but when I look into their eyes, they're all saying something different and they're all saying the same. They're saying, I really would like some hope. And it occurs to me that if we Christians can't deliver hope and its practical manifestations, literally, who on earth can do that? Now, I don't intend to tell them, or I haven't to date, that I'm a Christian. I don't intend to quote scriptures or give them Bibles. But what I can tell you is that when I go down to my chair by the water three days a week, I'm praying a blessing on all those businesses. I say to God, um, on the basis of who you are and who I am and what you have given me to do, I'm praying for a blessing on these businesses. I'm praying for wisdom for me when I advise them. So I guess that takes the loop back to where I started in terms of what God gave me nearly two years ago, down by the beach, and which is a place that I go, um, and where I'm working with him now in terms of how I can help these businesses into the future. In terms of your comment about 22, uh, I think I read in a business publication, 22 is going to be messy. Um, but I had another epiphany and decided that maybe three months ago, if 90% if of New Zealanders got vaxxed is probably a good outcome. There's going to be 10% who won't be, whether it's six or 12 is by the by, and the reasons don't matter to me. Um, I'm going out, Josh. I'm going out into the community in 2022. Um, I'm going to be working around a lot of trade businesses, many of whom don't have great COVID protocols, but I'm not going to be part of a culture of fear this year. Mm -hmm. I'm going out. And the simple reason is I asked myself, what would Jesus do? And that's what I think he would do. So for me, um, I'm looking forward to working with people who desperately need help this year. 
um, and I'm prepared to go out there and mix and mingle with them and do the best that I can in God's space to, to do that. So that, that's been my, my epiphany, if you like, um, and, and what God's been talking to me about over these last months and years. Thank you, Gray. Thanks very much. Yeah, someone said in one of our breakout groups the other week, um, I'm going to be careful, but I'm not going to be fearful. Yeah. And I, I kind of think that sums it up. I think, I mean, our Christian faith, uh, it doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're not diligent and we're not careful at all. Um, but the Christian faith does call us not to, to let, not to be held captive to fear. Yeah. And I think I certainly feel that, that nothing is certain in life, nothing at all. We never know what each day is going to bring, whatever it might be. And certainly seeing my folks back in the UK who are in a different space altogether, really. Um, I mean, we had Christmas Day uh, where we were trying to get Nan to go, Nan and Granddad, who've been locked up for, you know, they've had, they've had two jabs, all their boosters, but they're frightened, you know, they've, they've, they're, they're frightened. And I persuaded them just, just look, everyone's going to take a lateral flow test, which you can do in the UK. You can just take them. All the family said, no, we'll all take a test in the morning and then let's get Nan and Granddad down because mom, my mom's, who's 88, uh, her mental health has definitely taken a hit. She says it herself. And, and part of me is thinking, this might be your last ever Christmas. You're 88. There's, a, there's quite a few other things that could claim my mom and dad. They've been in, an, in and out of hospital. So I'm asking the question about quality of life as well for them. Um, as it was, um, my son's partner tested positive that morning <laughs> for Omicron. So it was all cancelled at the very last minute. The rest of the family were in their cars ready to go down and, and, and came up positive. Even though the person... Um, who's also been double backed was was completely fine. Um, didn't 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 even know they were ill. They just took it because we want to make sure for Nan. Um, and poor old Nan, that to miss out on on the Christmas Day dinner. And I felt so conflicted for them. I just thought, you know, they were so looking forward to seeing family. So it puts a lot of strain and stresses in complex ways, and that this has. And I, I don't think we can underestimate how it's it's affecting us in, in so many different ways but i definitely think not being fearful um has to be at the the core of how we approach things um yeah i mean any any final thoughts from you then gray it's lovely to talk to you by the way great to talk to you um i will probably ask any final thoughts and then if you would pray for us that would be great i think a prayer for all of us for 2022 well you know i think um you know me well. I'm fairly upside focused, and I think I think there are opportunities. If there's one thing that there's one thing that's really struck me is I think this is front up time for Christians. I, I think the days when governments and other organisations can make material difference to people's lives may may well be on the way. And I think we Christians may well be called outside our comfortable Christian spaces to do more. You know, and and I've always wondered why God has assembled so many talented people in our wonderful church, you know, for relative to the size we have talent and you just wonder what God is preparing us for. So I wonder if I could just leave that as a sort of a warm challenge. It's something I'm thinking about and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of needing to, um, to make more of a stand on things than perhaps I've done. And, and I'm just offering that as a, as a very warm challenge to the people of St. George's that, Marim and I love so much and look forward to seeing you again this year. Yeah. It's, it's a great community to be part of. I, I mean, I, I feel the privilege every day. I really do a sense of it. Absolutely. And I know Kim does too. I mean, Gray, would you mind finishing this particular sure. um, conversation, this pandemic epiphany conversation with a prayer for us all? Lord God, I just want to come before you and just say thank you. I want to say thank you for the blessings. I want to be grateful for the blessings and the privileges. Mm. I also want to be grateful for the hurts and the hard times and the things that we have all learned this year. Lord, I think if there's one thing that's probably most important, it must be difficult to imagine how people go through the confusions of life without a Christian faith. And, and for all of us, I'm really grateful for that. I do pray for us, Lord, that our gratitude and our blessings and our thankfulness might crystallize into things of valuable that are measurable in enhancing your kingdom. 
And I suspect that's one of the biggest prayers that I can pray for the men and women and children of St. George's for 2022. But I do pray for them all, Lord. I pray for peace. I pray for uh, joyful hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'll take away any culture of fear. And I pray that you'll raise our people up to be the best they can be in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.